Hi, good afternoon. My name is uh, Eva Conchal and I'm a CEE manager at the EBPA. And I'm really happy to welcome you all at the fourth webinar uh, in our CEE series that uh, we have started last year. Uh, I will say a few words about the, the webinar series, but before I do that, I want to share with you a couple of technical information about this webinar and the platform um, that you are using. Uh, on your left hand side, on your right hand side, you can see a control panel that you can uh, use. And the, the important part for you is the question section where you can post the questions to our speakers and we will be collecting them throughout the the webinar and uh, and then we will address them at the end in the in the Q&A so a few words about the series of webinar um, uh, of the webinars that we have been organizing for the last uh, few months um, we started this uh, i think in november this is our fourth webinar and and really we want to uh, make people familiar, uh, especially here in Central Europe, with the topic of impact investment, social investment. So we had already a couple of webinars that you can see uh, and watch the recordings online. Uh, they are all at our EVPA website. What is important is that we have been organizing this series um, as EVPA with a few partners inspired, a consulting uh, company led by Marta Leszewska, who will be also leading the conversations with our guest speakers today. Uh, Firley and Castore, uh, first family office, uh, first Polish family office, um, and Staszek uh, will be presenting today, and then Polish Private Equity and Venture Capital Association. So really happy to have those partners with us who are also helping us to, to promote, to spread the information about um, those webinars. Uh, today, uh, the webinar is a little bit different from the ones we had before, um, because actually one of our partners will be, one of the partners of the series will be presenting today, uh, Stasiek Kastory from Firle, Firle and Kastory. We will have also Viktor Warchałowski from Early, an impact-driven uh, company. You will hear more about their work. And Peter Clark uh, from Social Impact Capital uh, is joining us today. And he has been super, super kind because he's now in Texas where uh, it's uh, actually right now it's 6 a.m. So really happy to have you here. And Marta, whom you may recall from the previous webinars, um, leading the, the key part on theory and practice on the different topics that we are presenting, Marta will lead today the discussion um, with our panelists. So I encourage you all to pose the questions. I think we have really rich content today. Uh, we aim to finish the, the content part around two o'clock. And those of you who want to stay longer and ask questions, you are more than welcome to join the Q&A session at two o'clock. So without further ado, Staszek, uh, the floor is yours. This is our team today. I think you can see our panelists as well. Um, Staszek, you start. Marta, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to, to, to meet, uh, meet with you today. My name is Stanisław Castore. I'm representing Firle Castore, as Marta said, and we are a uh, family investment firm based in Poland. We concentrate on the investment in technology, early stage technology companies. And we deeply believe that we have to, uh, we are at the stage where we have to combine impact approach with VC strategy. And that's the future, that's the only way. Especially as we believe that technology and that we have the examples in the last year the technology can solve the problems we are facing and the fact that that we were able to prepare vaccination in that short amount of time it's it's such a great success and it shows the the, the potential of technology in in current years so uh, we believe impact is the future and we also believe that the role of private capital in that matter is very important so Private capital has to put pressure on investors, on enterprises, on, on the huge corporations, etc., to to show them that they have to change the way they work today. Uh, I also like to think about myself as a new generation and as uh, 
we have just 10 years to 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 to, to make our gas emission globally smaller twice uh, it will if we will do that or not it will affect directly my life it will direct uh, it will affect life of my kid, kids so i really believe it's my also responsibility to 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 do as much as possible to to change to change the world we are living in uh, currently right now uh, i wanted to start with a quote from milton friedman it's from new new york times from september 13th in 1970 it's uh, Friedman's doctrine, it's, it's a fundament of, of our current capitalism, of capitalism as we know it. Uh, I'm not here to discuss if the road that we started uh, then was, was right or not, but what we know is, is, is that we have now currently have to change the way we think, the way we invest. Uh, and example of that, the, the, the Proof of that is another quote. Um, sorry, I didn't actually say what Milton Friedman said. So what he said is that our investors, uh, that uh, our responsibility is is to maximize profit, financial profits for our investors and for investors, for our employees, uh, employers, sorry, uh, etc. So the the main goal is to earn as much money as possible. That's in the simple words. So uh, if I could ask you for the next slide. Uh, but that way of thinking it has changed it's uh, just few three months two months ago larry fink the ceo of uh, blackrock the, the one of the biggest um, investment holdings in the world uh, shared with his share, with his investors his annual uh, annual letter uh, in which and now i will read because i think it's very important the more, your, the more your company can show its purpose in delivering value to its customers, its employees, and its com communities, the better able you will be to compete and deliver long-term durable profits for shareholders. And you see that's like completely different approach from what Milton Friedman said. And uh, as it comes from one of the most important person in, 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 in investor, uh, investment world, it shows that we change the way we think about investments and even the biggest players. What's funny about this letter, it was actually only about impact investing and sustainable investing. So it shows how even the most important people in that area, they change their mindset and they try to take different directions. Just one more thing, could you go back for a second? There is one uh, one more quote. Uh, it's it, regarding that, of course, that changing this approach is climate risk is an investment risk, but it's also great historical opportunity. So we have to think about it as an opportunity, not something uh, something really really hard and different uh, different from what's what we have experienced until now. So moving to the next slide, few words about how VC uh, works uh, has grown in the last decade. So in 2010, there was around 20 unicorns in the US. It globally, it was between 50 and 60. Uh, during the 10, 10 years, the number of unicorns, unicorns for those who don't know, don't know are the tech companies that are valued over $1 billion. Uh, billion. So the number of unicorns in US grew from 20 to 240 in 10 years, and globally from around 60 to 500, and I even got the, the, the statistic that said 600 unicorns globally. Uh, the value of annual global VC investments was uh, around 75 million in uh, 75 million in, in 2011, and last year it was 264 billion, and currently in 2020 it's, it was even over 300. So if you see the growth from 75 billion to to over 3 300 billion in just in just nine years. And what's important from our perspective today, please go back for one second. It's a, it's a climate tech investments. In 
2013, it was around 418 million, just million. And currently it's, it's 16, billion, uh, 16 billion in the last year. The, this number grew by, as you see, more all, almost 4,000%. And the grew of the investments in, uh, in climate tech, it's, uh, it, it grew three times more than, for example, in AI. But big part of that is those are investments in transportation. Actually, the 60% of the investment currently in climate tech is transportations like Tesla, uh, etc., or mobile, sorry, uh, mobility uh, startups. Let's move to another sl next slide. So. What is the goal of venture capital investors? It's hunting unicorns. So this is like when you are an investor, you are looking for this this company that can give you that can have a valuation around one one billion dollars. And probably if you invest if you invest in such company that will grow to this point, you will you will win. It's just as simple as that. So to to make your chances as big as possible winning let's say you have to invest in disrupt disruptive technology exceptional team with uh, in the companies with uh, scaling global scaling potential and that can operate on global markets those are very important aspects and one more very important thing is that you have to build a portfolio of companies so in venture you will not win statistically you have 10 companies seven will fail two of them will do just okay they will do good and one of them is this potential unicorn let's say and now if you will not build the whole portfolio company your chances of failing are uh, are very high uh, and because of that there was a, you know the mindset so the mindset was to earn as much as possible uh, in venture capital. Let's move to another slide because this this my mindset is changing. So uh, investors and startups from Silicon Valley are looking for different approaches. And one of those, except instead of looking for um, unicorns, investors are started uh, looking for green zebra. So green zebra, it's it's a company with stable profitability, uh, profitability you know what I want to say, I can pronounce that, uh, profitability, profit, no, doesn't matter, uh, business sustainability, positive social impact, and the company which is avoiding dilution. So that, as you see, it's a completely different approach from how current this the silicon uh, silicon uh, silicon model works i think that would require the complete change of uh, rewriting the rules of this investment but that's that's the way we i'm not saying that's the right way to go it's that's a revolution for sure but that's one of the approaches that we sh as in vc investors should test uh, in our future um, investments. Let's move to, to, to another. To the, the, and I think there is very important role from family offices, private capital, uh, VC investors in changing how uh, projects are built, how investors think about, uh, about impact investing, etc. So first of all, the best approach is when you, uh, you as a VC investor, show that you embrace ECG principles yourself. So you are the example that your portfolio companies can follow. Uh, a big role of that is in putting it in LPs. So your investors, uh, I believe they should put pressure on you to embrace such ECGs in uh, uh, in, in your in, in your fund and then vcs should expect more from uh, from startups so what i like to hear when i talk with startups is when they present 
team, they present their uh, go-to-market strategy, business plan, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but also they include their impact approach in what they do in business in their business model. And actually, I would like to, it to become like the golden standard uh, of venture capital and how we communicate with uh, with, with startups and where where we focus during our due diligence. Let's go to what well, next slide. Probably some of you already seen this 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 graph because we believe that that's the most important graph of our series of webinars. So Marta already told you about it a lot. I wanted to, to tell you where I see venture capital investing on this graph. So I believe the sweet spot is sustainable investing. So we can adopt progressive ESG practices in portfolio decisions that are. Uh, expected to inherit the value and i really don't believe that if you want to connect impact approach with um, still financial returns on the same level so let's say 3x on the portfolio that you can take any other approach uh, just the negative screening right, like in responsible investing is just not enough and thematic uh, and impact investing that may be too too narrow to 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 build the, the strong portfolio here. Uh, let's go to the other to another uh, slide. So I wanted to divide the kind of startup sectors that we have currently into impact by default, impact by design. What I understand by that, impact by default are those companies which from the definition are impactful. So impact tech companies, med tech companies, education tech, renewable energy, cybersecurity. Impact is, is built inside their business models. And there are also impact by design companies. So operating in, let's say, not very impactful sectors, but that try to make their businesses uh, the change change the way uh, the, the, their sectors work and that's fashion sustainable fashion is very very good example transportation uh, electric cars fmcg beauty uh, or organic cosmetics food food tech agrotech so those are all traditional sectors that try to be right now change into more impact impact driven uh, approach Let's go to another slide. And I, at, the, at the end, I just wanted to show you some of the of the very different companies that I think are very good examples. Molecule One, I'm proud to say we are an, an investor there. That's the drug development company. They have a software that support the process. Uh, Beyond Meat, you may have heard about them lately. They signed a contract with McDonald's. They are actually the unicorn one of the unicorns, uh, and they produce plant-based meat. Vinted, it's a Lithuanian company, also a unicorn, that promotes the circular economy. So there is, you can, it's a marketplace to sell used clothes. Early, you will hear about them more in a second uh, from Victor. Supply Compass, a very interesting company with, uh, with, uh, that is that's assuring fashion companies that your pro process from design to 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 delivery is sustainable. Watershed, that's the in latest investment from Sequoia, so that's very impressive, very good uh, VC fund. Uh, they enable you, you are able using their their solution to track your your footprint and also in cleanup. The, the huge project that is aiming to, to clean plastic from, from the ocean. Let's move to my last slide. I just wanted at the end to, to encourage you to... Can we jump to another slide, please? This one. I, I just wanted... That's the Pavel Bovnik. He is very recognized and uh, um, very talented Polish photographer. When we started working uh, as, a, as a family uh, investment uh, firm, we thought, how can we make our 
impact uh, idea stronger. And we started to, talking with Pavel. Uh, he has a beautiful um, collection of photographies that, that, that were inspired by colors of extinct animals. And what he tried to show is that how much we lose because of the human activity, how much beauty we lose. And what we believe is that by cooperating with power, we're making our voice stronger. And we are in completely different sectors. We are from completely different worlds, but our goal as, as humans is uh, it's common. We have the same goal. So we should make our voice as strong as possible, cooperate with each other, and that way put pressure on government, enterprises, investors, etc. And I would like to encourage you to do to do to think the same. Uh, enough for me. I'm now uh, I'm now passing passing microphone to to Victor uh, from early, and hope you'll I'm sure you'll enjoy both his and Peter's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, Stanislav. Thank you. And first of all, thank you all for, for inviting me for, for that great, great meeting. Um, yeah, I will I will wait for the for the presentation just a second. Victor, could you put on your presentation? Oh yeah, okay, uh, it works. Yeah, there is I can I can uh, so it the uh, it's either I can do it or you can share your yeah, screen. If you, if you can, works. if you can make it full screen, that would be would be great, and we can we can kick off from there. Okay, let me just switch. Wonderful, wonderful. I it's loading. Yep. All right. So uh, my name is Viktor Warchowski. I'm CEO and, and co-founder of Early. And our goal as the company is to repair the air by you know empowering people with the knowledge about air they breathe. And I, I want to tell you a little bit about the company, but also um, a little bit about um, about our story and how we decided to start Early. Uh, can I can you go to the to the next slide, please? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, air pollution is one of the killers of human beings on planet. This is like a scientific fact. Uh, there are more people dying because of air pollution than tobacco uh, or smoking. Um, it's it's bizarre to think, you know, how COVID changed our lives over the last, you know, few months and and one year. Uh, but air pollution is killing it has killed more people in the same time as COVID did and you know whole world stopped because of that but we are not thinking about air pollution. Air pollution is reducing our global life expectancy by on average like three years and I think last year 2020 shown starting with wildfires in California uh, with COVID and uh, you know how um, the spread of coronavirus was connected with with air pollution and few other stuff. I think last year showed that that human health is the ultimate priority. And um, I'm, I'm I'm you know I'm so happy to leading that company and and also seeing how we can improve the um, the air. And our um, story begins in 20, um, 2012. So if we can go to the to the next slide. So this is the the moment where I, together with um, my colleagues from, yeah. So this is this is Krakow, and this is like a Krakow uh, in Poland, which is very highly polluted um, city. And I uh, moved to Krakow from a smaller city in in Poland, and I started studying at the University of Science and Technology. And I was um, I, I was always like frustrated and angry at um, the situation with air quality in Krakow, and I found it really bizarre that we are missing um, air quality data about uh, the data about air quality. Uh, I was trying to find that. I was trying to learn more about air pollution when I was, you know, being active when I was. Um, you know, running when I was cycling, but I couldn't find um, information about air quality. And I was studying technical physics. And next slide uh, is showing me together with Alexander and, and Michal. We were um, 
all studying technical physics at the University of Science and Technology, and we were always thinking about air pollution. And we, um, as engineers, we decided to create solution that can inform people in real time about levels of pollution. So. And basically, partly we did that because we were we were runners and we were training for the marathon, which is shown on the next slide. In 2016, I, together with, with Michal and Alexander, we finished that marathon. So this is me finishing. And when, I, when we were going for that run, we were always checking what's the level of air pollution, just to, you know, avoid some health issues, some respiratory problems. And um, on the next slide, you can see how our product looked like at the beginning. So we just took, you know, like some sensor to measure air pollution, some circuit board, very simple one, and some electronic parts to, to detect particulate matter in the air and then learn more about it. But the idea was, was like a bigger. We wanted to deliver that data to people. We wanted to deliver that to governments, to businesses and to provide hyper-local data um, about air, air pollution. And our mission um, was to repair the air by building the single source of truth for air quality data um, globally. And we, together with Michal and Alexander, after finishing that marathon, we decided that we want to start another marathon, which is building our own company and which is, which is building great product and providing that information to the people, which will, I will tell you a little bit later on. So we started hiring people. We started building great team around, around us, um, like R&D team based in Poland, but we started hiring people in, in London and the, and the US. And with top talents on, on business, um, business front, we, we decided to scale that product. But on top of that, uh, like hiring people, there are also people that are supportive, that are mm, backing you, uh, investors. So we are um, backed by um, UK-based giant ventures uh, fund, which is uh, supporting purpose-driven companies and a, a group of, you know, fantastic business angels, including Sir Richard Branson family office, Ronald Cohen family office, and, and a few other great, great um, folks, former enter entrepreneurs, including Bolt CEO and the former CMOs of Spotify and, and Gojek. Um, but coming back to the, to the product a little bit, so um, over the last few years from that marathon in 2016, we are building our product, which is global air quality platform with open access. So our goal was not only to, to measure air pollution, but transform that information into actionable insights and provide it in an easy way to people, uh, to governments, to businesses, so they can check what's happening with the air in real time through their mobile apps available on you know, like different, different platforms, web application, and customer dashboard, API, and so on and so on. So thanks to that, they can make some decisions how to improve air quality. And you know, some of some uh, people are asking, okay, but you are measuring air pollution. You are not improving air pollution, but your goal is to repair the air. But we are also providing forecasting and um, prediction for for next 24 hours. So thanks to that, cities and um, businesses can make some actions. For example, some um, some some cities and some companies are introducing free public transport based on the data or they are you know finding hotspots in the city and they are making some some actions so it's and, and also one of our impact kpis in the in the company is that we are checking how air, this this you know installing these devices and measuring air pollution is helping cities and gov and, and businesses to improve air quality and how air quality is getting better and it's it's, it's amazing to see that some cities um, in uh, which we are working with they after installing our devices and you know getting this powerful tool about um, and, and and getting this information about um, air pollution they realized how um, bad air quality is in some places and thanks to that they introduced some policies they made some actions and thanks to that they in, improve air quality which is a huge goal not only for us but you know our customers and partners that we are working with yeah and and i wanted to stop here for, for a minute and, and tell you a little bit about companies and and business and, and cities that we are working with so 
We are providing our solution in a platform as a service model and working with corporates. So for them, they are using that information and sharing it with employees and their customers, and they are demonstrating an impact of corporate cleaner initiatives. So working with some air purifier manufacturers, with um, some telcos and, and, and broadband providers, um, also working with some cities. And in a few years time, we, we acquired uh, customers like Berlin, Granada, in Spain, Oslo, uh, Jakarta, Krakow. And we are providing them actionable, easy to understand information to enable some policy changes. So these cities are making some actions to improve air quality, which is which is which is really really great, and it's it's helping them. Um, it's it, it, it's helping them to make these actions. Of course, we are working also with some I would say like eco um, NGOs organizations, and they are also they are having a lot of uh, projects. Um, that they are making to improve air quality, sometimes funded by some like philanthropies and, and so on. And, and they are using that data also to show, to have the evidence that this and that action improved air quality uh, and also to increase awareness. And the last but not least is about working with media companies. So we are offering these customers accurate air quality data and they are showing it the same as weather data. So working with the top media companies in Poland, in Romania, working with NBC, Reuters also, and they are presenting this data in real time to people, first of all, to get some more users definitely, but on top, on top of that, which is super, super important, to build this awareness and also to help people better understand their quality and what's happening. Because we also notice that people every day they are checking um, weather before going for a for a run they are checking what will be uh, you know what um, you know if, if it's going to rain or no but they are not checking air pollution and our goal is to build that habit into people that they are going that they are they, they want to change uh, and they want to check air quality and they want to change something in their behavior uh, to make sure that air quality is getting better and and better the next one um, slide is showing that it's not only about making an impact and improving air quality and introducing some policies and working with these cities and businesses. It's all, uh, also about our growth, our um, you know growing as the company and growing revenue, growing customers, and, and so on and so on. So over the last two years, we, we increased the number of countries that we are in. Uh, right now, it's almost 40 countries that we are presenting data from. We have over 25,000 uh, locations right now on our map, which are pro providing real-time hyperlocal data. And the number of our users, I mean, on API front, mm, is increasing year by year. In the same for um, the same for for our you know like revenue and number of customers. Uh, this is not public information, but you know, quarter on quarter, growing pretty fast. And from my perspective, when building purpose-driven company, this is not only about building, you know, great product which is solving a very important issue and is helping people to fight with, with air pollution. But it's also very, very important to have in mind that we are we are building here a company, and of course we are we are you know like we we are working with venture capital, um, but it's it's also important to grow and to have also like financial and other metrics and, and follow our KPIs, not only impact KPIs, but, but um, other ones. And the next slide is showing a little bit about our community and the fact that customers, they really loved our product. So we have over 2 million users using our data every day. And, um, and, and this is amazing to see how people are using. So we are empowering people and communities with that data and people really love that. Uh, so thanks to that, they can make some, make some better, um, better decisions. And I think I, I will come back um, as I'm, I'm coming to the, to the end of that presentation. I think when thinking about last year and thinking about COVID um, and how it changed our lives, and looking at the statistics that it killed like a few million people across the world, but at the same time, air pollution killed like a 10 million people. And you know, we are we are not doing enough about it. So um, I, I think that's that's the biggest thing that 
we are acting when there is like a COVID, when there's a global pandemic, but we are we are not acting when there's like a ongoing problem for last decades, which is killing more people than than than, than COVID. So thanks a lot for your for your attention and looking forward to Q and A. Uh, so um, yeah, can't wait for for that. And and I think the next one is 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 Peter. So can't wait to hear his thoughts on impact investing. Thank you. Victor, thank you very much. Actually, Victor forgot to mention that he was uh, that early was actually the company that built the awareness of how bad is the air quality in Poland and effects of that is that now currently government is is putting a lot of money to to, to improve the air quality. Unfortunately, not now, but that's big congrats to to, to Victor because they did an amazing job in that in that area. I remember when I was a kid. I always thought that the smell of this of polluted air was actually the smell of winter because it usually started when it was colder and this the smell typical for, for the, the time I thought that that's the winter. Just a few years ago, I realized that's the pollution. Victor, thank you again. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Now, now I wanted to, to welcome Peter uh, from Social Impact Capitals. Uh, uh, Peter will share with us the best practices from US around building the social impact funds. And I'm really waiting. I'm really, it, I'm sure it will be very interesting and for some of us, probably eye opening how, how to approach this matter. Thanks for having me, Stanislaw. And Victor, I just I love what you're working on. I um, absolutely love Ali and uh, I think it's a fantastic innovation. Um, so um, what I wanted to do is uh, give you a brief overview about what we're doing in our firm because when we do that, I think it provides greater clarity in how you can be a better impact-focused venture capitalist. Um, I think we're pioneering this strategy. Um, as uh, as Stanislaus said, I'm Peter Bruce Clark. I'm a partner at Social Impact Capital. As our name suggests, at our firm, um, you know, we're combining an impact investment thesis and strategy with a traditional early stage approach to venture capital. Uh, just the next slide. Um, we define ourselves as an early stage impact focused venture capital firm. Um, we're based in the United States, but have worldwide reach and are mostly um, a remote team. I'm currently in Austin and Texas. Uh, it is 6.30 and um, Sarah's actually at her house in Uruguay. Um, we exist to basically invest in companies that seek to generate a profound impact and venture profile returns. Um, at SIC, we basically do three different things. We invest in the best ideas and impact. We do impact arbitrage and are innovating the venture capital model to benefit from the advantages of generality with the benefits of a niche expertise. Um, so um, you may have seen, if you just go back a slide, just so I can sort of introduce Sarah and I. Um, so uh, a little bit about our, our firm. So the firm was started by Sarah Cohn, who's the managing partner in GP. She's the main investment decision maker at our firm. Um, and sometimes I describe her as the deal wizard. She's an amazing investor. Um, and I always joke that we would like to have even 15% of her brain because we'd be very lucky. Uh, she works on deals, working with entrepreneurs very closely and uh, excels at deep research. I'm her right hand man. I'm on GP track two and a head of network type character. Um, I'm different in kind of interface at the firm where I'm in charge of managing most of our external relationships. I do deal sourcing, screening, venture capital community building, oversee our extended team, uh, as well as our limited partners. Um, I have consulting background too, so I love portfolio support. So I mentioned our extended team. We work with over 55 different venture partners and advisors, some of the best minds in the world, such as Linda Avery from 23andMe, Stephen Wolfram, Sean Rad from Tinder, and a whole host of other people who you might not have heard of who are brilliant in their own right. Uh, our extended team is a differentiating factor and how we're innovating the venture capital model to get the benefits of both generality and niche expertise. Uh, we're deploying them as a kind of hub and smoke model in the same way that a pension fund uses outsourced managers to do certain mandates we use our extended team to plug and play expertise. Venture partners and advisors, they're remunerated on a deal by deal basis, anywhere from sourcing to even a, taking a board seat on our behalf. So with our extended team, we have you know, access to deep expertise in healthcare, deep tech, climate tech, biotech, and a whole host of other areas. 
So what do I mean when I say that we're investing in the best ideas and impact, doing impact arbitrage and innovating the venture capital model? So we invest in the best ideas and impact, which means we're sector agnostic, geography agnostic and cause agnostic, but of course concede that not all existential challenges are made the same in terms of the risks they pose to humanity. Uh, this means we're opportunistic, looking for highly scalable, profitable and highly impactful businesses that could meaningfully move the needle in any domain. Since complex system solutions are non-linear in solution, this means that uh, uh, non, so sorry, since complex systems challenges are non-linear in solution, this means that we need to tackle these challenges in a multi-pronged approach. From an investment management um, view too, we also love the strategy because it means that we enjoy natural diversification across the entire portfolio. So our biotech deals are not correlated with our ad tech and our climate tech is not correlated with our conscious consumer brands. With impact arbitrage, it's kind of both an investment thesis as well as a set of investment tactics and a strategy which basically captures value from um, a market that is a sort of endemic widespread misperception of impact at the early stages. So many impact driven companies are overlooked because they appear non-commercial for various reasons. And these misperceptions basically span from biases about impact, mission driven businesses or social entrepreneurship to biases uh, endemic to the industry, such as demographic biases. So, you know, um, venture capital in general is not that diverse as an industry. And as a result, many founders or novel business models are overlooked. Um, and so that leaves a lot of white space uh, left on the table. Um, and we basically exist to capture this early value at seed and between seed and series A, get our companies to just look and feel like any top performing company, regardless of their impact. Um, and we also pride ourselves on the fact that we've got a 93% hit rate with follow on financing being the top decile funds of Silicon Valley, but also globally. And uh, on the next slide. So um, finally, as I sort of mentioned, we're innovating the venture capital model to have the benefits of generality with the advantages of niche expertise. Um, we work with an array of venture partners and advisors and they plug and play in our deals. Um, and our venture partners are remunerated for their expertise. Uh, next slide. This gives us um, unparalleled expertise, portfolio support, and the ability to scale our firm over time. It also is the opportunity uh, for the best minds in the world to sort of gain access to venture capital uh, and, and kind of garner, uh, garner that experience over time. And it's a kind of launch pad for new talent. Uh, at our firm, we also provide verified track record to all of our extended team for a wide variety of different functions. Next slide. So a great example of this in practice is Open Invest. Uh, it's a now quite famous ESG robo advisor and portfolio construction tool. Um, and this is a great example of our strategy in process. So we had landscaped the market for a really long time. We're actually the first institutional check in this deal. It's so interesting to see the misperception of this deal because venture capitalists looked at it. It'd been through YC where typically, you know, the valuations are way more expensive um, after you go through YC. And venture capitalists just looked at this and they're like, we don't get it, like ESG, what is that? Like, it doesn't make sense, is this a nonprofit? And so we were able to get in at a really good terms um, and then work with the entrepreneurs between seed and series A to get them to a point where nine months later, Andreessen did the follow-on financing, which generated significant performance for us. Um, next slide. So for us, um, we have seen amazing performance uh, through our impact arbitrage strategy for our 2016 vintage year fund, uh, which was a micro fund. It's generating roughly 40% IRR. Uh, you know, that is in the top decile of all venture capital funds, not just impact funds. We don't benchmark across impact funds. We actually benchmark just uh, to top decile venture capital firms. And our more recent fund is also performing incredibly well. Uh, now we're in our sort of third year of deployment. Next slide. So we have many, many examples um, throughout our portfolio of this in action. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, we are getting also now into really competitive deals too, uh, for instance, with Actual, uh, where we're investing alongside Sequoia and Signalfire. Uh, next slide. 
We're also getting into deals where entrepreneurs uh, might not even be looking for traditional venture capital firms and they just want to have, uh, for instance, in this case, uh, an array of different uh, sort of influences on the cap table in order to speak their gospel about what they're building. Um, they're now wanting to work with us because of what we represent in the market, which is super interesting. Next slide. So as I mentioned, you know, we have an incredible rate of follow-on financing from the top decile firms and, and from just like sort of bleeding edge uh, venture capitalists. Uh, we not only have a 93% uh, hit rate of follow-on financing from the top decile funds, but after seed, 100% of our deal flows receives um, uh, financing at the A round. Uh, that's a crazy stat because 80% uh, of seed deals die. <laughs> so we really, really pride ourselves on these sorts of stats. And uh, we think the benefit to our entrepreneurs is really, really great um, because a lot of these top decile funds or lots of these sort of um, professional investors have resources, capabilities, and expertise that at the A round really like help them J-curve. Next slide. So to date, we're managing roughly 30 million. Um, we're also anchored by some of the best venture capitalists in the world. Um, so we've, we're, we really um, find ourselves very fortunate to have that kind of um, you know, expertise and, and that resource when we want to talk about any one deal. Um, but it's not always been plain sailing and it hasn't been um, always the easiest experience raising a first time fund, let alone um, a impact focused fund. So um, with first time funds in general, um, the issue is that uh, you know, LPs regard you um, as a, a sort of like new and, and unproven uh, investment thesis and, and, and group. And for that reason, um, you know, people, different sorts of investors might push back on, on the firm. Equally, if you're a larger investor, what you notice is even if people really want into your company um, or your, your fund, there's this kind of structural mismatch between supply and demand in the venture capital industry. So um, we've got all of these amazing, massive, massive investors who can't write these large checks because they become too much of a concentration risk uh, in the fund, uh, you know, they're targeting, you know, not being any more than 20% of a fund and they want to write a $50 million check and we're a $100 million target fund. So, uh, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting because some of these risks are also um, uh, sort of uh, uh, combative or, or, or contradictory to the fact that when you're doing things that are new in venture capital, they're also a source of uh, financial outperformance. So what's difficult, more difficult even for impact focused funds is the fact that there's a lot of disbelief around what's possible in impact. Um, and uh, it, this again comes down to the same biases that we see with uh, portfolio uh, company founders and their own businesses. Like they look at us and like, can you actually make money from an impact thesis? Um, can you actually deliver returns that are market rate or, um, you know, not concessionary? And we actually, you know, aim at above market returns. Um, also skepticism around diversity, which is crazy. So like the belief that, um, you know, how can you really make money um, if you're a woman and, and a female GP or, or if you're also, you know, um, a person of color, like, can you actually generate performance? So there's actually endemic skepticism and sort of implicit racism in that too, which is crazy. Um, also, um, there's a skepticism around whether or not we're actually additional in the market. So uh, people say, okay, well, what's the causality between you investing in that company um, and, you know, if you just waited a little bit longer, would have the market funded that anyway, right? So um, actually pointing to the point at which that you might have actually had additionality in your capital deployment, um, which, you know, in the case of Open Invest, uh, though we can point to that as an example, uh, you can say hypothetically somebody else could have funded it. And then greenwashing acquisitions, which is like, you know, people are worried that uh, in this quite throthy now uh, ESG and impact market that um, there might be a number of uh, managers in, in the market that aren't um, truly doing what they say that they're doing in terms of accounting and reporting. Uh, next slide. Mm. But there are hacks around this and it's not impossible. And I think now we're in this era of um, uh, you know, uh, a whole um, host of people around the world and different kinds of 
um, uh, investors now looking for a lot of authenticity and looking for a lot of frank talking in the space. I think we've had this sort of legacy of, of misperception. So now the whole, um, I think, goal of if you're raising an impact focused fund is to basically build trust with your LPs and de-risk the opportunity as much as possible. And a lot of that comes down to storytelling um, and showing your work. So what I mean by prototype it, I mean, if you can um, create uh, data points that prove to investors that uh, your strategy could be valuable, whether or not you're doing that through angel investments to begin with, or running a prototype fund that we did in our instance, and showing that it can generate performance, that's how you slightly de-risk the opportunity. Um, showing the work, so showing how you're being additional to the portfolio companies and how you're getting them to a point where um, you know they are really attractive to mainstream investors within your um, particular asset class, depending on what you're doing. Knowing your audience too uh, is really important. So talking to somebody over the age of 50 um, who has made their money in a, in a certain way might be male, right? Um, and uh, you know they have a very specific way of viewing the world. So narrating it in terms and with um, sort of things that they privilege uh, in in a pitch, understanding that you have to sort of cater it to them. I find it much easier to um, pitch to, for instance, um, millennials, and uh, I say like sort of late stage Gen Gen X, um, because I think that everyone can agree that um, we live in this like pretty volatile or uh, this, this uh, era of increasing uh, social and environmental volatility. And for that reason, we have to act now, but also we can now prove to points in the market, like um, with uh, BlackRock's um, you know, ESG portfolios that you know, impact could be a source of financial outperformance. And then you have to regularly communicate it with uh, the people that you're building relationships with. You have to make diligence really easy. Um, with what you're building, so making sure that you have everything that they need in order to um, actually assess you from, from an institutional uh, standpoint. And then, frankly, it just takes time. Um, you have to understand that um, not everyone overnight is just going to hand you millions of dollars. Um, that's, yeah, that's not how it works. So you have to have a feedback loop cycle of some performance too. Um, and uh, yeah, next slide. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit of context about the U.S. impact investing landscape, um, and I kind of want to be big takeaway of this to be is that it's only a drop in the ocean, and it's it's a really sad fact that um, I, I earlier last year um, I was talking to one of the investment directors at a quite famous British university endowment because they get to see basically everything. You know, they're managing about um, eight billion dollars. And um, my question now to him was, oh gosh, you know, uh, I know how the US ecosystem looks like and there are few and far between impact managers. I know Europe is quite good too in that regard, but it's also much smaller market relative to the US uh, in this regard in terms of like AUM um, of the private equity market too. Um, what's it like in China like or Southeast Asia? Are you seeing you know, amazing managers develop out of Southeast Asia that have an impact focus? And the answer was emphatic, no. <laughs> so um, for me, I always find this slightly sad, but also um, really exciting at the same time because it, it proves that we are actually like market leading. Um, and you know, impact capital within early stage venture capital um, is very, very small. In, in, as, a, as, a, as a market and it's, and it's growing and it's definitely proliferating and we're part of a variety of different networks where I can see this proliferation, but it still represents only a tiny proportion of the uh, US venture capital uh, industry. So next slide. Um, so why is it so underdeveloped? So it, um, in general, there are long feedback cycles in venture capital. So whereas in public markets, you can point to now ESG data as being a source of financial outperformance relative to traditional portfolios, within venture, it takes 10 years. So DBL, who I mentioned on the previous slide, you know, they're now on their probably fund three um, after how many years now of operating. And you know some of their winners in their portfolio were things like uh, Tesla and SolarCity, but you only had that sort of feedback loop of performance relatively recently. Um, also, I sort of mentioned there's a structural mismatch globally, actually, 
um, in the impact uh, or private impact scene where essentially you've got all of these institutions that want to deploy into funds like ourselves, but because of the growth of the institutional market and the size of these multi-billion dollar funds, um, there's, there's a mismatch between uh, appetite and check size and the size of which these new managers are, are building their funds. Um, you know, we would love to come out the door trying to build a $300 million fund or a $500 million fund, um, but then you've got all the risks associated of being new emerging manager. And the question there is, can you manage that amount of money? Like that's sometimes that we hear. And um, so outside of that, the other um, kind of tailwind, I guess, is the fact that, and it's a tailwind, but it's also a collaboration opportunity too, is that many families and individuals are trending towards going direct versus going through managers. And there are different sort of trials and tribulations associated with that. Um, it's amazing to work with owner operator families in general. Um, we really benefit from that as our firm too, because it helps with like distribution and portfolio support. Um, but the other uh, interesting thing is it makes the market and the impact market way more competitive too, um, because you've got more people who are really inspired to try and um, sort of uh, make the world a better place through their private deployment of capital. And then I guess the final thing is just this enduring bias, which is widespread. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so despite the tailwind, so why do we continue to fund the best ideas and impact? So next slide. Um, so we basically think that there are like very clear economic reasons why you want to invest in impact, at least in the US and in any Western country that has emulated the American model uh, as a way of building sort of flourishing societies. Um, what we've also seen in the uh, last you know, 30, 40 years is the astronomical rise in uh, costs to uh, consumers and businesses for what you could categorize as essential needs, goods and services. Um, so, you know, healthcare, education, energy, transportation, all of this uh, has dramatically uh, appreciated in price, also relative to real wages, which have been relatively stagnant to inflation. So, and then these inflated prices. And so that, that impacts both the consumer as well as businesses. So we just think that where there are high prices, there are opportunities to disrupt. And that's the businesses that we wanna kind of invest in. Um, in the sort of Peter Thielian world, you would describe this as like the sort of transition to a, uh, economy 3.0. And the mega trend as part of that is the fact that we live in this paradigm of insane um, costs relative to our living wages. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so we basically believe that impact is the future of business. Uh, we think it's the future of uh, investment management in general. And uh, we think it's going to be a source of financial outperformance over the next 50 to 100 years. Uh, we think that it will be a source of alpha too, um, but it will also be really essential in building enduring, resilient and adaptive global societies. I sometimes talk about uh, the fact that I'm a survivalist or I'm a uh, uh, survivalist capitalist um, because I think that uh, we do need to invest in all of these areas that, um, you know, present some of the, the largest challenges to humanity. Um, the advantages of being generalist means that we're actually able to invest in the things that actually matter uh, and, and opportunistically capitalize on the most attractive deals, both from an impact perspective as well as from a financial perspective. Um, we also love our strategy because, um, you know, because we're agnostic about where we find deals, like for instance, we found a deal in Belgium and brought it to North Carolina. We have this fantastic uh, valuation at arbitrage. In Silicon Valley, valuations tend to be uh, pretty inflated relative to the rest of America um, and also then the rest of the world. Um, so we're able to basically pick these amazing uh, opportunities and this fantastic talent and usually get it for cheaper. Um, we also love the natural diversification. There's a lot of uh, information and a lot of data that has emerged um, over the last uh, two years that show that if you're well diversified um, and you are looking at um, a variety of different sectors and, and making lots of different bets, uh, that can also be a source of financial performance. 
And we basically just love investing in talent anywhere. Um, and we think that it's the team that leads to successful exits and not uh, necessarily like uh, where you are located. Um, so um, we sometimes get asked, you know, what do you look for in a target company? And I would say the answer is that we're maximalists. Uh, we're actually more demanding, I think, than the average venture capitalist. Um, we look for humongous impact uh, targets uh, or, you know, you know, the, the proxy of that is TAM. Uh, we look for like total addressable impact or, uh, you know, what we could tackle there. Um, we look for early indicators of performance. That really depends on the sector, actually, uh, in terms of what, what that looks like. Um, we look for strong teams with relevant expertise. So um, coincidentally, you know, having experience with a particular challenge or a technical uh, breakthrough, surprisingly enough, sometimes translates to um, business outcomes and being able to commercialize it. Um, market appetite, so we love to understand whether or not downstream customers might use the product or you know, there's a pent up demand for um, what, whatever the company is producing as a good or service. Um, secret sources and moats, so unfair uh, and, and unfair advantages too. Um, these are sort of um, little secrets to the company which show there's a massive differentiator and delta between that company and other competitors in the market. And then significant tech breakthroughs and paradigm shifts in consumer behavior, uh, where we're betting basically on shifts within you know, two to three years, um, upcoming shifts in, in either uh, technical viability or like sort of consumer behavior or business behavior. Next slide. And so, you know, we're really um, proud, I think, to date, you know, we've, um, uh, and, and I think this is where we can, we can, we can stop here. Um, so we're really proud of the performance that we've had to date, the companies that we're funding, the, you know, the beauty of my job is we get to invest in all of these fantastic companies that are very, very inspiring, and at the same time make significant return. So that's where I'll stop. Oh. Um, we should, um... uh, Peter, thank you yeah. very much. I think the most important thing you said that you should prove that is that you can actually, with impact fund, you can out outperform traditional impact funds. That's the myth that you myth that if you invest in impact, you have to uh, agree to a little bit smaller uh, outcomes, the, the, the financial returns. So. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. And now I will pass the microphone to uh, to Marta. Uh, Victor, could you join us also? Yep. Uh, we have a few questions coming. We will uh, now uh, let Peter to have a glass of water and rest a little bit. <laughs> and as I know that Victor needs to leave uh, us sharply, uh, in 15 minutes, so I have a few questions uh, to Victor. Actually, I would like to address uh, first. It, Pat, uh, Peter actually mentioned about biases that uh, financial markets has towards impact uh, businesses, and I would like you to uh, ask you the question: How how did you experience those biases uh, on your journey, on your first? Uh, how were you? How you were looking for a founding at the very beginning. Uh, when you first approach investors, when you first approach private equity, or maybe it was more through grants, uh, was the impact and leverage, or it was a challenge actually when you talk to the potential investors in the very beginning of your journey? Yeah, Could that's, you share that's a your very, experience? very good question. And I think it was it was a challenge. Yeah, I, I think it was it was you know difficult to find like some some funding, um, because we were you know like a software as a service marketplaces, um, AI and stuff like that. It's it's hot and you know investors are looking into that. But I think the most successful investors are looking behind the curve. So you know right now it's it's like a as I said like marketplaces and like some med tech are in are very very hot and when we were you know started when we started our fundraising um you know in 2019 before our first pre-seed when i was talking to investors they they really didn't get what we are doing and they were asking so okay i i got your point of view but why it's so important so why you're i got your point of view that you are solving one of the you know 
most important environmental issues, but I don't get it really. I don't get the why it can grow super fast and and I, I definitely that was the challenge i think it's much much easier if you are having some investors already and they trust you and they they and you know other investors they also see that uh, uh it's it's interesting it can grow it's not only about making an impact and changing the world but also it's about like financial metrics getting revenue and and, and growing um but yeah i i think exactly what what peter said i think at the beginning this is a challenge but after getting the first money in the bank and getting first investors then like a top top firms from different parts of the world are looking at you and and you, you know like as soon we will we will announce our another funding and this you know this round which we are which we are closing basically you know next week and it's much was, was easier for us than the previous one and so so it's it's totally aligned with things that that peter said all right. So, also, like, could you share maybe tips for other startups uh, that we have some uh, some founders on on the line as well, like how how to present the impact, how to present the company, how, how to sell impact actually. Uh, yeah. Uh, to VC. Yeah, yeah. Difficult question. Very difficult <laughs> one. And I was expecting some easy ones <laughs> to be to be honest. Uh, uh, I think it's mostly it's mostly about you know being um, passionate about things that you are doing one thing and show how big it can be within like a few years. When we were doing our first funding, I was trying to be like you know like a conservative, maybe some like a Polish mindset, thinking that we can grow to two markets in a few years time, and that was not enough. So I think we should we should you should aim for for you know for top and and building a global uh, company here. Um, and so which is which is which is you know sometimes difficult but you need to 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 you know to aim for the top yeah to be the, the global company here and and that's your aspiration and that's uh, that's it's, it's very important and i think also using some um you know to show um i mean like how we can how some comp companies customers can use that data and how it can improve the world and i think this is something what was like missing when we are doing our first funding that we are telling that okay we are measuring we are we are providing that information but how it can you know lead to to improvement and right now as i said like we are having some impact kpis so we are showing that our solution is in, is improving our quality in, in, and this is the fact this is not like something that we want to do this is real fact and i think using um, you know, showing that um, you know, like that in improvement that that your company, for uh, let's say, improved. Um, I don't, I don't know, like for example, decrease the emission of CO2 by X is a real number, and this is how you can show the impact. It's not about you know um, telling that you will do this and that um, in the some time, few years time. It's mostly about showing numbers on impact, and I think. You know, this using that impact KPIs is, is difficult, but I, I see some companies, uh, I think Beyond Meat is a perfect example. They are they are claiming that they reduce like CO2 emission by X percent. And this is like a number. This is a real fact. This is not something that, you know, the, it's, it's, it's their dream. This is real action and something that they are doing every day with the product. So I, I think transforming impact into numbers is really powerful. And I, I, I'm sure that that we should we should use more more um, purpose-driven, uh, you know, like KPIs in the in the in, in the companies that we are building. Thank you very much, Victor, for for these tips. Uh, I think very valuable and easy to forget uh, for, by many founders. Like there is, a, I know that pa passion and uh, it's very it's very important. It's a crucial to be. Um, to be genuine and that's what you are doing but uh, KPIs and actually being able to measure the impact it's also very important if you want to speak with the business people <laughs> around the world uh, so thank you for your for your time thank you for your for, for your participation uh, today I know you, ha you have to run so thank you very much and uh, thank now you. actually thank I you. will thank you. I will I will switch uh, to Peter and about this uh, impact and how i have a question from from our public as well if you could um expand on one or maybe two companies in which uh, you are you already invested and yeah. to show uh, how um 
how, how, how the decision process was looking like? Uh, why did you invest it in those companies? Uh, what was the magic ingredient in those yeah. people that you actually decided to, to follow? Uh, and, and, and then how you, the second part of the question, how did you manage to transition those companies from impact to actually invest in ready businesses? Totally, totally, and and uh, and thank you for that question. I think um, kind of what Victor was just talking about in terms of um, uh, quantifying the impact and having that as a obligation as a KPI is super important. We actually look for all of our portfolio companies that there is intrinsic impact built into the business model, um, and then we hold people accountable to that too legally. So we actually have legal arrangements where you have to articulate, monitor, and measure your impact over time. And it usually proxies your revenue too. So it's quite interesting. So just to give you an example of some of our portfolio companies. So I love all of my our portfolio. So it's really hard to like pick ones without seeing like a favoritist. Um, but uh, in general, um, I'd, I'd say some of the, some of the ones that have, broken out more recently. Um, one company that has done particularly well, uh, they just received their follow-on financing by DCVC Bio and uh, a variety of other biotech-focused funds um, at a much larger valuation as Totus Medicines. So Totus, interestingly, um, they're creating covalent drugs and their first company to basically create designer covalent drugs. And covalency is simply the degree to which a drug can bond with a target. Um, so imagine uh, like a climbing wall, right? And you're trying to climb onto the climbing wall. Some climbing walls have easier to grab onto um, kind of areas for your hands and, and feet to go. And that's the same way of covalency. So it's the degree to which it, it, it bonds with the target. These drugs historically have been found by accident. So penicillin is covalent some cancer drugs, some HIV drugs, um, aspirin is covalent, but there's been no way to systematically make drugs covalent. And for that reason, there's this whole swathe of undruggable diseases like, um, like what that society just does not have drug solutions for um, that were totally undruggable. And so TOTUS could come in and create designer covalent drugs. So you imagine with outcomes in diabetes or with like um, can't like certain cancers like they've already created a breast cancer target drug a brain cancer and a lung cancer drug in in a year which is insane right um, that's really 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 valuable we found this deal uh, when we're George Church we we're actually a, he's one of our venture partners he's based in Boston uh, at Harvard and we went for a bioinformatics event we were, we're just like curious nerds and we like going to things basically and um the founder there neil knew of us from twitter he knew he sort of knew what we represented in the market and and what we were about and um and sort of our value add too because he knew all of our sort of network and then when we talked to him we were like wow this is such like a breakthrough technology or it seems like really really compelling I wonder how we, we we could diligence like the technical aspect of this because the team looks really strong, like um, you know the the um, the financials could be I mean really profound, you know just from a, a basic sort of um, doing basic like just venture diligence on the company itself. But then we're like technically how do we understand that this holds true? So then we could plug and play Jason Ponton, who's one of our venture partners. Um, he actually inhabits two of our board seats for two of our biotech deals, and here Jason had been on a non profit trying to develop one covalent drug <laughs> for the last decade and they had failed to do that so Jason knew immediately wow like this is amazing and from his own uh, position in the market and his own uh, resources and capabilities was able to do all of the technical diligence on the actual underlying breakthroughs that that Neil, Neil had made uh, flash forward we had taken 14 percent of that deal we, we, I mean, we had got a significant stake in that company uh, for a million dollars. We took the entire round at seed. Uh, and then at Series A, we basically socialized them with the um, top decile community. Um, so, you know, you think of like the founders funds of the world, the Andreessen's of the world, all of these sorts of people. And um, so, this, you know, the secret sauce there was the technological breakthrough and um, then the, the team, the strength of the team really. 
um, and our ability to actually diligence it too. I think, I mean, like the fact that we were able to do that really, really quickly, where they had barely seen too many other venture capital firms, like this also shows you the arbitrage that we're having in innovating the venture capital model. Um, so there's that component. You also asked me another question, um, a subsequent question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The second, the second, the second uh, part of this question is actually how do you uh, manage those companies to transition into like full investment yeah. ready businesses so, in the future? So, so yeah. first, so, how do you, why why do you take this company under your yeah. wings and then uh, yeah. how do you manage it? Perfect. So 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 another example of a portfolio company that we really like that lends into this question is Emmetwise. So Emmetwise is now rated globally the best carbon accounting and reporting software solution in the world out of 270 companies. Um, they won the Sucker Prize last year for that. Uh, an equivalent in the market is Watershed, that's Sequoia funded, but the technology in Emmetwise is the considered the best in the world. Uh, it can go to scope three, carbon accounting and reporting. So that's going really, really deep into how you're doing things as a business. Um, Generation are using them, Warburg Pinkers are using them. Um, they have the problem now, now, right, of way too much customer inbound where like they're just trying to keep up with customer demand, which is a fantastic problem to have. When we found them, they were based in London. They had had a couple of early kind of pilots that were going quite well with some decent um, kind of partners, but not well known, very, very small. Like one was a, a real estate manager, private equity real estate manager that they were doing a pilot program with. They're Venezuelan founders. They're very, very technical um, and what we worked with them on to get them to a point where they were really attractive at the A round is we worked on all of their marketing materials, all of their storytelling around their impact and framing their impact in terms of the costs, not just cost reductions, because ultimately the product is going to help you manage your kind of carbon tax, right? Or like the taxes associated with your carbon footprint, particularly in Europe and, and London. Um, but that tax is also going to come in, in the US. It's like totally inevitable. Um, but, um, you know, there it was like not just about cost reduction, but eventually you can also point to things in those businesses about how you could do things differently in ways that can generate the P&L, like the actual profit. So what's interesting is it, it moves from just being this tool that is about avoiding tax or reducing your tax bill to actively doing things differently. The profound impact is, imagine, a co imagine this company, Emmetwise, is used globally across all corporates or all global corporates who start monitoring and measuring the way in which they are doing things and, and, and the areas where there are excesses with their carbon footprint, right? That has humongous ramifications, even if those companies marginally change what they do because they've got global reach, right? These massive corporates. So a lot of it was about storytelling, uh, finding them original customers. So for instance, I got them their first cu customer, which was Capgemini, um, which mm -hmm. is sort of the French equivalent of Accenture. They had these pilot programs that then meant that they rolled out to like Coca-Cola and L'Oreal and these humongous clients. So customer introductions, translating what they do into more commercial terms, and also like sort of productizing the company between seed and series A. So it looks really appealing and hits all of the notes of what a lot of these series A vets, investors are looking at for and they're kind of pattern matching. Because at a certain point, you see so many deals as a venture capitalist that you end up finding these kind of little, almost like a biomarker on your face. It's like, it's like little markers in the deck about what's an indicator of performance. Um, and being very, very clear in that story, I think, about what your KPIs are and where, where, what your journey is and how you're progressing. Great. So the first thing is a technology. Uh, the, the technology that is developed, it is breakthrough and innovation. And then you actually help to market it in, in terms of marketing, sales and like business development. So uh, it's, it's very important. Thank you. I have actually questions for both of you because probably you will have a different answer. So Stashek and Peter, uh, and it's more question about due diligence process. Like how do you make a due diligence? Is it some kind of structured uh, way of looking at the company? So I don't know, have a scorecard, the ESG scorecard or some other things, or is more intuition? Uh, tell the truth, please. 
I, I can start, start with you. I will, I will, I will, I will start with you. Uh, so, it's a tough question because uh, in our region, in CE uh, mainly, but generally in Europe, the, the impact, uh, impact company startups did not develop to this level where we could just pick different one from the market and then analyze them day by day. There's just not enough still. I, I see after what what uh, after Peter's presentation that is completely different situation in uh, in US. Actually, I believe that early uh, and what Victor did it's it's one of the best examples. But unfortunately, we have just a few. So there we have to go usually with our instinct, with understanding uh, what what the business is about, uh, and then during after after the investment working with uh, with our team so actually we we focused right now on mostly on cyber security we see it as a new way new impact not traditional impact but new way of uh making people's life let's say safer because all, all all data protection and protecting of i don't know bank data or data on on the internet uh, it can have a huge impact on people's lives, like losing money from your bank account, etc. So, unfortunately, we at, at the moment there is no enough projects in our region to just have a huge structure around that because we would not be able to build a portfolio. We have to go more with our instinct, but uh, and then work, then work with the companies. Thank you for that, and Peter, definitely different. Um, yeah environment <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm wondering how how in depth i go with our process um so it's very what i'll say to begin with is it's very sector specific and we've got lots of screening mechanisms before we like choose to go into full diligence on something because of our portfolio construction strategy so sometimes people are like oh are you a seed investor are you an a are you pre-seed like we don't think about that we, we consider ourselves early stage We've got three different strategies. One is tracking, conviction, and harvest. Um, one doesn't care so much about ownership. More of it is about kind of tracking entrepreneurs over time, building relationships with them. It's a small check typically um, where we kind of anchor ourselves into the deal. There we've done up to 30 hours of due diligence. And we say, you know, we want to see these entrepreneurs meet these certain hurdles in order for us to get more comfortable with the deal over time to the point where we're like, maybe we want to do a conviction investment. And what we've ended up doing is kind of scaling up on our commitments, typically at like a pre-seed or seed valuation, as we've seen traction points. And we're like, okay, like, yeah, the questions that we had outstanding from our diligence was X, Y, and Z, and now they're here, like fantastic, right? Then with our conviction strategies, we're doing up to basically 100 hours of due diligence. Um, there we're plugging and playing expertise depending on the technical complexity of the deal. Um, and so, you know, for that to, to be able to even go through with that deal, it has to go through all the tech diligence. We have to do all of the background checks on the founders. We have to like interview with the customers to see about what the appetite would be. Um, we do all of this legal due diligence too. We do like forensic accounting on their financials. It's, I mean, it's pretty robust process. Um, even though, you know, I would say with financials um, at the early stages, you know, much of that is like licking your finger and putting that in the wind to some degree. But there are lots of, uh, there can be lots of indicators of like poor presuppositions and assumptions about where your business could go over time. And I think that becomes quite clear. So we have an internal senior analyst that we work with um, who also has applied math PhD who can pretty much rip through, <laughs> rip through your financial model. Um, and so, and then between seed and series A, so we do this robust diligence and oftentimes we give it to our A round investors um, so they can see what came before. And by, by series A, because we're coming in at seed and, and we don't, we don't invest at Series A if we had not invested in seed. We've typically worked with those founders for, for over a year. We've done, you know, probably at, at least four quarterly, you know, check-in calls, right? We've done like over a year, four check-in calls. And then on an ad hoc basis, worked with them monthly or weekly or whatever it is that they've needed at that time. So 
at that stage, we actually really know the founders very well. So at the A round, you know, sometimes we're even helping founders with their um, their diligence room. I've, I've created one of our our, our own fund diligence room, uh, which is considered one of the best on the market for venture capital. And so basically, what we've been like is this is how you structure it for the top decile funds, so that they can easily go through all of your material um, as fast as possible. Um, I feel really bad for the A round investors, to be honest, because they have they they have to like level up and get acquainted with the deal way faster, um, and yet like have all this mammoth information. But it kind of makes sense to have the top decile funds, all these like legacy funds, follow on to our deals because I think that they've got now the resources and capabilities to do all of that diligence at the A round. But like, I much prefer to to start at seed um, because I think. I think you have a greater developmental process. You lose less money, <laughs> I think, uh, too. Um, so I think uh, I, I really like our strategy. I think it's it's a really good approach to like risk management at the early stages. Yeah, thank you for sharing those three strategies. And I think it works. Uh, looking at your followers of uh, the investors from the investors that you are starting, I think it's uh, it's, it's pretty. Market has a lot of confidence in your uh, in your due diligence strategies. Uh, so uh, we are coming to the end uh, of our webinar and the Q and A session uh, today. So uh, thank you very much. I don't know if Eva will appear. <laughs> Let's say goodbye in a second. Um, but uh, it, it was really great to have you uh, today, early morning over there, afternoon over here. Uh, and uh, I hope you will have a good day and thank you for sharing all insights with us. Thank you, yes, thank you okay. so much. I, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Staszek. Uh, I want to invite you all to our next webinar, uh, which will be in April. And uh, that one will be dedicated to the banks and what's going on in the banking industry and how banks are approaching impact investing as well. So I think it will be interesting. And then in May, uh, we'll be on impact management and management. And, management. and actually, Martha <laughs> will be also That's showcasing <laughs> her experience and her work in the, in the ESG area and, and more. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be available at the EBPA website. So those of you who couldn't make it to watch till the end, uh, please uh, see it at our website. Thank you. We'll, we'll share it on our LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very Thanks. much. It was lovely to have you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.